Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, students, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you here at the Romanian Academy at an unusual time uh, because, uh, as you know, normally our talks take place in the afternoon or in the evening. Uh, and uh, this is why I'm particularly grateful to you that you have come. I know that there are many things going on uh, in Vienna at this uh, particular time. Also, I know that there are some important meetings at the UN, at CTTPO, I think. So it, I very much appreciate it, and I'm sure that our one appreciates uh, your coming. Uh, this is going to be, I think, a very interesting uh, event that we're going to have. Uh, His Excellency Nasser Dira Yuda, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia uh, and current member of the Council of Presidential Advisors uh, is going to talk uh, to us on Indonesia's diplomacy on the promotion of democracy in Southeast Asia and Pacific region and Your Excellency, I welcome you here.
1976. Uh, you spent a year at Oxford University of the Foreign Service Program. Uh, you hold a uh, Master of Law degree from Harvard University of Law. I mean, you cannot get better than this. Uh, and you also earned a Doctor of Juridical Science in International Law for the University of Virginia, a school of law. So you are a very prominent, eminent uh, lawyer and scholar. You uh, held uh, several important uh, posts. You held, uh, in my opinion, the most important uh, post in any ministry uh, of foreign affairs, uh, which is the political director. I think uh, ministers uh, are, are well advised to listen to their political directors. You were ambassador, permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, uh, which we also met some of my colleagues who are here today. Uh, you were ambassador uh, to, to Egypt uh, and uh, director of international organizations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But the most important thing, of course, is uh, that you were uh, foreign minister of Indonesia uh, from 2001 to 2009. Now, this is quite a long time, uh, as ministers uh, come and go. Uh, and uh, it is, therefore, a great honor to have such a distinguished personality here at the Diplomatic Academy. We look forward uh, to your speech. Uh, and I think you kindly agreed uh, to then uh, discuss uh, with the audience uh, and answer any questions that the audience may have. Your Excellency, may I ask you to While we were uncertain 
on the prospect of the democratic transitions, we were quite certain that the freedom that people began to enjoy would never be taken back. And as democratic roots grew deeper, we reached by 2004 a point of no return. And certainly by 2009, when by then we successfully had a series of national elections of 1999, the direct presidential elections and governors, district heads and mayor by 2004, and then followed by uh, national elections, including presidential elections in 2009. However, it was quite early that Indonesia started to project democratic values in our diplomacy. As, as stated, as I mentioned before, it was in 2002, barely three years after we initiated before. In that context, Indonesia's diplomacy was ahead of its time. We didn't wait until the process of reform made sufficient progress in all areas of reform, or reformacy as we call it. As you may recall that in 1999, the monetary crisis was called the East Asian Monetary Crisis struck some countries in the region, beginning with South Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. But it was in, only in, uh, in Indonesia that the monetary crisis turned into a severe economic crisis. And at the same time, it had become uh, multidimensional. Yes, economic crisis, but unless we experienced social, political, and security crisis. With the stroke of a monetary crisis, double everything in negative sense. Double the number of people who live below poverty line, double the number who are unemployed, double the number of our uh, <coughs> debt to GDP ratio, which by 1989 reached of about 90%. <coughs> To deal with the economic crisis, you know, by 1998, our economy went down to a minus 14 percent. While for 30 years we enjoyed an average economic growth of between 7 to 8 percent, we experienced a drop of minus 14. It means quite a lot, uh, more than 20 percent. Gradually, by the year 2000, we were able to make progress to a zero percent. That's why we gradually move up to uh, between five to six at the end of first at the end of the President Mandela's term in 2004. Uh, we experienced a horizontal conflict, conflict between ethnic groups in Indonesia. You know, Indonesia has more than 300 ethnic groups, and we have uh, uh, communal conflicts. Uh, and South even has had uh, religious connotations. Conflicts in Kalimantan, in Central Sulawesi, in Ambon, not to mention the uh, armed conflicts that we have in Aceh since year 1976. So, uh, <clears throat> by the uh, beginning of the year 2000, uh, the domestic and international skeptics predicted that Indonesia to disintegrate. Many seminars and workshops were held in Europe and the United States. 
and then they raised a critical question to smash after the Yugoslavia or the Soviet Union for that time. Of course, uh, the crisis also uh, not only brought uh, the economic uncertainties, but Indonesia also at the same time experiencing a weakening government. Uh, because one major pillar of central reform is to promote decentralization as against strong centralization under the new order government or military government. So we delegated more powers and authority to and also accompanied by quite generous revenue sharing to our local governments at the provincials as well as districts and uh, 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 town level. <coughs> While at the central governments in search for a check, checks and balance which was absent during the time of military dominated governments. From the executive which practically monopolized power, the pendulum swayed more to the legislative branch, making our parliaments so powerful. Uh, <clears throat> The military then was in the process of adjusting the South. Uh, we, they withdrew from politics and undertakes military reforms. Our police, which used to be part of the armed forces, then had been separated. That's why the weak governments, uh, transition of the military role, the weak our policy institutions allow this uh, horizontal conflicts, communal conflicts happen in different parts of the nation. That's why it was really the beginning with the crisis, Indonesia was on the brink of politics. That's why Serena, many people based on the prospect of Indonesia breaking into pieces. So it was at this day, at this, this uh, situation that our diplomacy initiated uh, to project democratic values to our immediate regions. Then it was thought, I found later that there was reference to this policy as Indonesia playing hegemonic role in Southeast Asia. Not that. Our neighbors tend to see our reforms only from the perspective that what's happened in Indonesia was a lot of noise. They didn't capture the essence, the magnitude of change that we uh, experience in Indonesia. That's why initially, when we launched this uh, concept, ASEAN political and security community was received with skepticism. Uh, by our neighbors. But thanks to the process of decision making by consensus, uh, consultations, by October 2003, when Indonesia hosted Bali, uh, in Bali the ASEAN summit, uh, our leaders accepted the concept of ASEAN political and security community, in which Promotion of democracy, uh, respect for human rights and good governance are a core factor. It was, of course, uh, quite a revolution because for 36 years, under the notions of harmonious relationship among its member, Prosecution making by consultation, now and consensus. The introduction of this strange animal, the promotion of democracy, was certainly not easy. Even my uh, 
predecessor, you may know him, Ali uh, Alas, asked me, are you serious to talk about promotion of democracy in Asia? I said, yes. Why Asia? Because we found that as we are in the process of Change. Following the economic crisis, some, some key members of ASEAN, ASEAN lost its competitiveness. I recall that in 2002, when Singapore hosted the ASEAN summit, Prime Minister Goh Chok Tong said, he said he, 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 to him, 85% of foreign direct investment that came to Asia went to China. And he questioned, he doubted whether the remaining 15% went to Southeast Asia. That's why Singapore came up with the idea of ASEAN to establish ASEAN Economic Committee. But for us, it did not enough for ASEAN to establish ASEAN Economic Committee. That matter, we need to develop a more balanced cooperation in ASEAN, and that's why ASEAN Political and Security Committee that we I proposed in 2002. Because we learned that even to have a case of Myanmar that had a shortage of or deficit of democracy and human rights, it had become big problems for us. It divided ASEAN. We spent a lot of time and energy, even within ASEAN meetings, to discuss the issue of ASEAN, not to mention ASEAN exactly our partners in the West. So that's why we see the importance to uh, promote uh, political development in ASEAN if we truly wish to transform ASEAN into a strong and cohesive uh, organization. On the other hand, ASEAN, you can Imagine, of 10 ASEAN countries, we are divided into countries of democracy, countries which are, say, quasi-democracy, and uh, <coughs> rules with the single party rules, and military junta at the extremes. Uh, we cannot develop cohesion. If our political orientation is so divided, I was stuck myself when I knew, of course, that we are divided into three, into three different categories uh, in terms of civil and political rights, in terms of the reports of Freedom House. Uh, I was struck myself when I visited Myanmar in January 2000. Two. said, my God, here are ASEAN. Indonesia experienced military dominated or military governments for 32 years. But I was struck by the fact that in Myanmar, generals who occupied civilian posts proudly displayed their military in full military uniform in office. But the members of the regime, without hesitation, proudly mentioned that our, our military group. In Indonesia, civilian officers and generals who occupied civilian posts under the dual function, political and military function, defense function, they were suffering rather than military uniform. They were shy, but not in Myanmar. So I said, and that's somewhat me. me uh, I mean, strengthen me that we should initiate the process of change by introducing the uh, political development aspects. Yes, we need to cooperate on economic trade investments, but nonetheless, from our own experience in Indonesia, when we adopted an imbalanced concept of development, namely development that stressed heavily on economy. Development and neglecting political developments in one stroke of a monetary crisis 
with Indonesia on the brink of collapse. That's why, from our experience, we we wish to develop a strong and cohesive ASEAN. We cannot just simply talk about economic, trade, investment, free trade areas and others. We have to address the lack of political development. You know when ASEAN was expanded since 1997, from 5 to 10, we have new members like Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Myanmar. And we talk a lot, a lot about developing that. But developing that was means, was meant nothing but the left gap in terms of economic development. We never mentioned about the gap of political development in ASEAN. That's why our concept for political development in ASEAN to balance cooperations, integrations, community, that not only focus on the economy cooperations. For quite some time, I strongly believe that there is a close relationship between development, democracy, and human rights. This was the issue that we debated uh, in Geneva, Geneva on, uh, when, uh, on the eve of the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and the uh, transformation in Europe in terms of ideological orientations from a divided Europe which was democracy and communist socialist bloc into a Paris Treaty of 1990 which set a new ideology of Europe which centers on multi-party democracy uh, open and competitive economy and respect for human rights. But in our regions, you may surplus, surprisingly notice that the waves of democratization, I think the fourth wave of democratization, that's, that occurred following the end of the Cold War to other regions, not to Asia. We, we, we exempted ourselves from the process of democratization. And why? First, because, like what was practiced in Indonesia for 30 years, in which, why bother about democracy? What's important is that we can promote economic development. And interestingly, in East Asia, Number of countries were labeled as new economic tigers of Asia reached that status under an authoritarian rules. Korea, the Pak uh, Myanmar, Thailand under military regimes, Malaysia under uh, Mahathir Muhammad. Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew and Indonesia under President Trump. That's why we're bad about promotion of democracy. That's why we don't care much about the uh, political development. As representative of Indonesia to the Commission on Human Rights since 1989, uh, and participated in the international discourse on the relationship between developments, democracy, and human rights. I strongly believe that in a way Indonesia could change the policy on human rights. We may change, but I mean to promote respect of human rights if we continue to uh, experience a deficit in democracy. At the UN Commission on Human Rights, we gain respect when we talk about the economic social and cultural rights. Because through an average of 7 to 8 percent annual economic growth in terms of access to education, right to education, our people truly uh, enjoy uh, uh, much greater access. Among nine populous countries uh, in the world, uh, school age children in Indonesia entered school. 96 percent then, nothing to mention in terms of uh, 
right to health, uh, right to food, uh, right to shelter. But exactly on the other half, namely on the spec of city and political rights, then this, it was, this was our problems. Uh, of course, as diplomats, we have to defend, I have to defend Indonesia, but often I have to defend something that indefensible. That's why I don't believe that the function of diplomacy is only to project our national interest abroad. But diplomacy has the obligation to communicate from uh, the, 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 transform the, the, the situations at the international level to our domestic audience. In other words, rather than to represent Indonesia uh, uh, abroad to defend something that indefensible diplomacy has the obligation, has the moral obligation to change policy, national policy in the kitchen. So, uh, completing the first UN Commission on Human Rights in 1989, I came up with the idea and I wrote a paper, policy paper, reorientations of Indonesia's policy on human rights. It's not uh, Indonesian diplomacy, but Indonesian uh, uh, policy on human rights. We centers on three uh, points. One, for Indonesia to uh, establish an interagency forum on human rights, meaning we take charge rather than ignoring human rights as a Western concept. Two, for Indonesia to play an active role in the regional and international discourse. You can imagine the UN Commission existed since, exists since 1947, but for a country of then 200 something millions, we made an effort to join the Commission. That's why part of that proposal is for Indonesia to join, and which we did since 1999. And the third was for Indonesia to establish a national commission on human rights. You can imagine that uh, President Trump eventually by January 1993 was quite cost from 89 to 93 that eventually Indonesia established a national commission on human rights a week before the second world conference on human rights held here in Vienna. So it was quite a process. And what made this, uh, in, in, in view of the uh, letter, uh, uh, letter on initiative on promotion on, on, of democracy and human rights in Asia, while we succeed in establishing a National Commission on Human Rights in the midst of uh, a military dominated government, in the peak of Military government, government. We believe that while well, us in ASEAN we have quite diverse groups, in fact, according to Freedom House report of 2012, out of 10 ASEAN, only one that is categorized as free. Four partly free, and five meaning 50% of ASEAN members is not free. That's from the perspective of civil and political rights. And yet, as I mentioned before, that by 2003, ASEAN leaders agreed to uh, put democracy and human rights on the ASEAN agenda. Uh, and when we drafted the ASEAN Charter starting in 2007, by 2008 it was clear that uh, the new ASEAN Charter would adopt, it, would adopt and enshrines the, the promotion of human rights, respect, uh, the promotion of democracy, respect for human rights and the governance in our agenda for the first time. That's why we expanded our uh, horizons. So by April 2008, 
even before ASEAN Charter was uh, ratified by all ASEAN members, we began to establish a new forum. We call it the Bali Democracy Forum. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as a forum for sharing of experience and best practices on the promotions of democracy. We don't believe that democracy can be imposed. As values we impose to others that tend to be uh, uh, negative reactions. That's why our approach is uh, sharing of experience and best practice. Some of them would say that, oh, it's good because you have successfully transformed it. Indonesia, I mean, Indonesia has successfully transformed itself from military government to uh, uh, full fledged democracy in a relatively short period of time. But we knew that, despite of that success, that we have our shortcomings. That's why the Bali Democracy Forum is meant not only for us to share our experience with others, but also for us to learn from others. Uh, that's the kind of approach that we promoted. Second, the value democracy in the Asia Pacific regions, ranging from Lebanon in the west to Fiji in the Pacific. And in the past two years, it was attended by 83 countries of the regions, plus observer countries from Europe, from Africa, from Latin America and regional as well as international organizations. So it has made, it has made BDF, as we call it, the primary forum of dialogue on democracy. You cannot see such a forum, a large forum as BDF, to talk about democracy forum. So we complemented that process because, as we have mentioned, that when we initiated, we invited Myanmar, for example, and announced Masama was from Europe, and the state came to me. So, serious, we fight Myanmar, and Myanmar is not a uh, country of democracy. He said, yes, because this is not a forum for only for, for, only for countries of democracy, but countries which aspire to democracy. And, in fact, I must say that, uh, to the credit of Myanmar, Myanmar actively participated at the political process within the BDF, and the Prime Minister is the head of state. But also at the technical level of cooperation in Myanmar, send, normally send strong delegations. They, 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 they felt that they were quite comfortable to have interactions and, and uh, uh, learn from each other. Uh, <clears throat> now, The IPD, the Institute for Peace and Democracy, which I initiated, in which now I'm sitting as patron, uh, we have developed cooperations with so many countries, both on country specific, in particular countries of democratic transitions. Uh, in fact, we expanded our activities beyond the Asia Pacific regions to also. Egypt and Tunisia. We developed in the past three years what we call Egypt Indonesia Dialogue on Democratic Transitions. Uh, we have developed Indonesia Tunisia Dialogue on Democratic Transitions. You know, uh, we have access, but we have similar interests, namely that, that uh, because we have similar problems. To me, or country with majority of Muslims, we have both in Indonesia, in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, in Yemen. Very important and fundamental question how do we accommodate Islam in state political life? In other words, while Egypt and Tunisia are struggling in the process of drafting of their constitution, whether or not Egypt or Tunisia, for that matter, would or for an Islamic state, or whether Egypt and Tunisia should opt for the application of Sharia 
This is likely questions, and in, as part of the, uh, the science of workshop that we have, both in Cairo and in Indonesia, uh, we share experience. How our founding fathers, uh, in 1945, opted for middle ground in which Indonesia uh, is not a secular state in the sense of strict separation between the state and the church, or mosque for that matter, but also not a theocratic state. But in Indonesia, the promotion of religious life is part of state obligations. That's why we have a minister of religious affairs that religions, be they Islam, Catholic, Christian, Buddhist, Hindus, Buddhists, are compulsory subject in our, from kindergarten to university. Uh, on the application of Sharia, Understanding our pluralisms, country, uh, more than 300 ethnic groups. Uh, actually, the initial draft of, in our constitution, we have put a provision on the application of Sharia for all Muslims. But then, on the eve of the adoptions, on the 18th of August 1945, we deleted. It was interesting that religious leaders of Indonesia, both from rather conservative, I would say, or traditional, like Nadat Ulama, which is now the largest NGO in the world, has some 40 million followers, and Muhammadiyah, uh, which has some 30 million followers, facilitate the compromise, the, the middle part in which the provisions on the application of Sharia was deleted. Of course, in a way, our national government, our parliaments would adopt a law that would contradict uh, the contravention or the positions to the Sharia principle. But that's what Indonesia, that's our uh, partners, Egypt and Tunisia, are struggling now. Uh, on the eve of my departure from Jakarta, Actually, I came from Bali because I have received the partners of Myanmar. He visited the Institute for Peace and Democracy and we did the pilot program. In fact, starting at the end of this month, we organize uh, a workshop. And this would be part of a series of workshops like we did with Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, so that's on the country specific. Uh, and, and Sudan and Yemen has I mean, have, uh, request, requested Indonesia to develop similar programs. In fact, uh, on my way from um, last week of my trip in Morocco to commit to participate on discussions on the Arab Spring as viewed by the Arabs and others, of course, by participate as others. Uh, because, and I would say my, my view that from the very beginning to me, the crisis that erupted in Tunisia and Egypt and some other countries in the Middle East and North Africa are similar in terms of their roots with our crisis. And that is basically the imbalance concept of development, concept of development that stress happening on the economic and neglected political one, while the economy uh, allowed people to have, uh, say, uh, increasing income capital. But when people's stomachs are full, when through education they have uh, better brains, people will demand nothing else but greater freedom, more political space. This is something that what we can learn from the Arab Spring. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, on my way back to Tunis, by end of this month, uh, stop by in Cairo to sign an MOU with the Alakram Strategic Institute of Strategic and Strategic and International Studies, also with the American uh, Cairo University, because we have started organizing a daily lecture, uh, both organized from Bali, but uh, also from Cairo. Uh, and probably with the Arab League, because some of the Arab League members, in addition to Egypt and Tunisia, but also the new 
one like Sudan and in also. Uh, so it's quite quite uh, challenging, and, and I think uh, countries of democracy can contribute. And with all our uh, shortage term of expertise, perhaps experience, I'm sure we can do something. And, and for that matter, Indonesia welcome and thanks the support of our friends of democracy that we establish. Uh, for example, on training for political party leadership, democratic uh, leadership, we don't have the modules for training, but through cooperation with Australia, they led us a module for training on how to uh, develop a political platform, how to win the election and organize themselves, political parties, organize uh, for the elections, how to develop a coalitions, etc. We don't have the modules, but Australia has Center for uh, Democratic Institutions has, and we adjust it because to the need of developing countries like us, like uh, I remember the first uh, workshop on democratic leadership. We had participation from 15 countries ranging from Iraq, Afghanistan to uh, Fiji. Likewise, the second one, we have participant, uh, participating, countries participating from uh, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and some island countries of the Pacific. So, uh, looking back, we are now, by now, 15 years in our reform process. Uh, doesn't mean that what we gain in terms of democratization is perfect. No. We have shortcomings. But nonetheless, it doesn't prevent us to do something on the promotions of democracy uh, by sharing of experience. And we talk, uh, you know, Egyptians are very proud of themselves. But when we started the process, said, who are you to tell us about? I said, no, we're not telling you. We're telling about our process, the success story, the failures, the bumpy roads that we travel, and for that matter, even as friends, you may learn from our mistakes. So, for not, in order for you not to repeat the mistakes of countries that more or less have similar, uh, at same level of development, countries that majority of Muslim countries that have been struggling in the process of nation and state building. This is the theme of this that we are uh, initiating as part of the uh, process of sharing of experience of this uh, and best practices. Uh, people may ask, what did you gain in this process? Have you transformed ASEAN into a democracy? To take a starting point of 2008, of course we are now five years, I said no. By having a new constitution, a new charter that commit ASEAN countries, in terms of political but also legal, to promote democracy, it doesn't mean by tomorrow all will be transformed fully into democracy. It took 15 years of Europe, starting from the uh, Helsinki Final Act to 1990, when all Europe embraced democracy. I, 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 thought, I, I thought that perhaps ASEAN would all are set by, I mean, after 15 years, all embrace the most. And uh, so it's a process. But it is a work uh, in progress, and it's not the work that can be done overnight. Uh, of course, China could be a good catalyst, uh, because China has become a model. Why about the world democracy? China can enjoy 12-14% of economic growth, annual economic growth in the past 20-25 years under 
one party rules. But I must say, the credit of Premier Wen Jiabao on the eve of his end of his term, in which, in which he said, and widely quoted, including by economist magazines, that uh, uh, China will only be able to enjoy its economic growth if China can and should undertake before. But the problem is how, uh, and that's what China it is, is struggling to manage. Uh, so, we hope that will be the case, but I must say that in our situation, China has been actively participating, uh, say, for the Bali Democracy Forums, and, and if China changed, then China model of economic development talk only about economy and economy reflecting political one uh, would cease. But after all, in this information age, when information flows freely, cheaply, it's more difficult for any authoritarian rules to maintain the monopoly of information, which is the key to their uh, political domination. Uh, that's why we need to inject deliberate, uh, that's the sensitivity, the sensitivity that every leader may have when certain progress in the economic field is achieved. And when people who feel that Side for them to enjoy greater political space. It's better to adjust the process. Had Indonesia adopted it in 19, early 1990, perhaps we did not experience the crisis of 1998. It's interesting that the editions of foreign affairs. And we see and talk about democratization in China. There's one professor, a Chinese professor, who uh, wrote an article, a piece, which entitled Democratize Yourself or Die. That's what we expect. Die means that doesn't mean that the entire country uh, disappeared, but it was a sudden death in the sense of disruptions of. Uh, nation and state building. I think we should encourage a new concept of sustainable development. Now we are in the process of drafting uh, the uh, post-2015 uh, development agenda. So far only three elements that have been more or less agreed upon, namely on the eradication of poverty, including Extreme poverty, two on social inclusion, and three on sustainable environment. I see the importance to include democratic and good governance uh, in that concept of international concept of sustainable development. Uh, I said democratic and good governance because. Uh, I must admit, in Indonesia, we are very democratic enough, but not yet to reach a level of good governance. Singapore is, is very proud on their good government, there's been a lack of uh, democracy. So, for countries to develop, yes, democracy and good government at once. Good governance alone is not enough, because good governance is actually, in a way, also a product of, of uh, a democratic process as well. So I believe we can have both democratic and good government to be included in a new concept of sustainable development uh, to replace the uh, MDGs that would end in the case. I believe developed countries, democratic countries uh, are a bit shy to talk about it. Uh, but to me, learning from our experience, learning what 
for what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa, namely the Arab Spring, are in sand. So I should end my, uh, my uh, presentation at this point. Thank you very much for your uh, attention.
like in the like uh, in Indonesia during the early years of the fall, when people began to enjoy their freedom, I don't think people would allow if their freedom is taken back. They would rebel against against it. But more than that, uh, from my recent visit to Myanmar, I visited Myanmar in 2012 and early this year. Uh, uh, two days ago, when I met with the foreign minister of Myanmar in Bali, at the Institute for Peace and Democracy, I expressed uh, my uh, appreciation to the extent of what has changed in Myanmar. I told the story of my meeting with the uh, chairman of Myanmar election commissions. Uh, he introduced himself uh, at the beginning of the meeting by saying, My name is so and so, I'm a Latin general, I'm a former member of the military junta. He said, I could have met the wrong person. And to my surprise, that he was at ease to talk about free and fair democratic elections. And of course, we all know that when Myanmar in February last year organized by elections, in which 45 seats were completed, 43 was won by the LMD and now was switch. And I commanded General Malaysia, uh, Myanmar Election Commission in no way that the opposition would be allowed to win uh, 43 of, of, out of 45 seats completed if the election was not free. So, uh, that's what I mean, the depth of the process that uh, they have been taking. When I visited Myanmar, I was surprised myself that they established a school of democracy uh, in which political activists, uh, they have more or less 40 participants for each batch, and I gave a lecture on two batch uh, at once, and, and it was quite lively discussion. Likewise, I met with a group of political parties under the names of democratic fraud. It was quite a uh, lively discussion in which Myanmar is uh, expressing their free. And, and uh, of course, uh, like the initial stage of transitions, they don't have experience. Uh, uh, they would tackle <coughs> bumpy roads like we did in the first 10 years at least. And, like the communal conflicts that occurred in Indonesia in 2002, 2000, 2002 uh, Myanmar experiencing communal conflict in Bohemias, in Buddhist versus the Muslims, and it was last week when I gave a speech at the Parliamentary Caucus on Human Rights, I said that I must say that uh, what's happened in Indonesia in 2000, 2003 was even much worse. So, uh, it doesn't mean by saying this, I endorse uh, the, the, the way the uh, groups in Myanmar treated the minorities like the Rohingyas people. But it must be, in comparison with our experience, that we understand the situation, <coughs> what we can do is the, to help Myanmar, and Myanmar has been quite open to, to uh, cooperate uh, with others in, in dealing with the, the their situation. Likewise, uh, Myanmar is still having serious problems in dealing with the, uh, they call it minorities. So far, they skewed ceasefire agreements with quite a number, except two. Right? And uh, the challenge for Myanmar is how to uh, follow up these ceasefire agreements with the final peace process. And for countries like Indonesia, which has successfully negotiated, the problem of our change. I think there are, some, there are many ways that we can share with and found uh, yesterday to this uh, and it's very open to compare notes like this. Uh, so, uh, of course, like uh, in many transi uh, transi democratic transitions, people have high patience. It depends also on the success of the economic, uh, economic, economic progress that is taking place now in in Myanmar. Uh, that's why uh, I said not only to fellow ASEAN friends but also to others that decided that Myanmar by themselves decided to change and to undertake reform, uh, uh, we have obligations to support 
because uh, the, the, the economic progress, but also in the air, uh, that's a mean the continuing process of the privatizations. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Ambassador, please. Well, uh, process of democratization is in a way complicates the works of diplomacy, both in terms of policy uh, uh, formulation and policy implementations. That's why, uh, during my time in office, you know, I strongly uh, see the need for us in the foreign policy establishment one, because in more open democratic in Indonesia, uh, we are not the sole uh, uh, party. We are, we are only one of the so many actors in foreign policy. Yes, foreign policy is but, uh, foreign ministry as the center, uh, of course, Indonesia in the present, but also parliaments, a uh, vibrant. Free media, but also uh, the, the role of civil society. That's what, and for that matter, we are held more, I mean, we are more comfortable. Uh, that's why we need to uh, reform ourselves in order for us to, in a way, be respected by other actors. But also on the world, uh, which is in a sense, a more inclusive. Understanding that others have a role to play. You know, I initiated, for example, a foreign policy breakfast, very informal uh, breakfast that's from 7 to 10. Depending on the issue, we invite uh, uh, politicians, NGO leaders, mass media leaders to discuss you know, issues of foreign policy because uh, it is a challenge for many of us how we communicate in terms of foreign policy. Or basic foreign policy and how foreign diplomacy is being implemented. And in order for us to get understanding, this have hopefully support of us. Uh, on the, that's, that's the need to, uh, for us to reform, uh, to change our, uh, in a way, uh, mentality and behavior. And then, of course, on our role I said that with the uh, reform, uh, in particular on the success democratization, we are gaining respect. We used to be seen by the West as the party, uh, but not no more. Uh, but likewise, the economic progress that we uh, continue to enjoy in Indonesia and the projections of Indonesia to be the sixth largest economy in the world by Second, I would say, according to the, the McKinsey Global Institute report in September last year, Indonesia will be, I 
2013, uh, in 15 years from now, will be the second largest economy. Uh, and of course, being in the G20, I think uh, we, we, it's opened the way for Indonesia to contribute more uh, in the international discourse on not only an economic but also on other. Political and security, uh, uh, I mean, uh, or, or, um, global governance, governance and political and security issues. Uh, but we, it's a big challenge for countries like Indonesia, also in the process of integration, not only in ASEAN, because in my January we start the, the ASEAN community, uh, but we are at the same time engaging our indigenous neighbors in particular East Asia. Uh, but likewise, I've been saying that uh, uh, we're focusing more on economic, trade, investment, for example, free trade areas, ASEAN, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, India. Now we are beginning to discuss the uh, East Asia wide uh, comprehensive partnership. So I was quite uh, quiet, um, uh, but Indonesia has been from the very beginning not only that we champion for more balanced concept of cooperation in ASEAN, but also in East Asia. Indonesia was alone when in 2004-2005 when we advocated the more balanced, uh, said, in balanced and inclusive East Asia. We are alone because some other 12 countries and regions who have all less agreed to more limited East Asia summit that comprises of 13. Indonesia was, uh, for the sake of more balanced uh, cooperation, we favor, we, we champion for the inclusions of India, which by definition is Southeast, South Asia, but also Australia and New Zealand, which are Indo Pacific. This is to mean it's meant to balance in a way China because we believe that when China has both the economic power by 2020 standard be placed in the United States as the number one economy. But of course with so much money in their hands, now 3.7 trillion US dollars in their uh, foreign currencies, uh, China can spend more on energy. So when both economic and military powers in their hands, uh, we must anticipate China will behave not the China, China's, not East uh, China's. And that's why 10 ASEAN plus Korea and Japan will not be in Japan. So that's why we need India and that also Australia and New Zealand. And Thanks God, while we were alone, in the end, this was the concept that is accepted. That's why the first East Asia Summit in December 2005, in Kuala Lumpur, there are 16 countries in the region participating at this process, which, I don't know, but perhaps eventually lead to East Asia community. But to me, uh, East Asian regions would be, which would be, the center of gravity of the world, since East Asia alone would contribute by 2014 some 66 percent of the world GDP. We sent a strong signal, wrong signal, I mean, when the issue of South China Sea or North China, uh, China Sea flooded the, the world media. To me, again, this is because so far, like. What we did in ASEAN before, we focused on economic cooperation, economic integration, but we suffered the lack of political development. It's something that we can learn from Europe when since 1975, through that single kind of act, actually, uh, Europe began to inject, uh, began to address. Key issues to political development in this part of the world. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I have to
say you, you, you mentioned also in your speech uh, the OEC CSC process, 1975. I participated yesterday in a, in a panel uh, which spoke about uh, what can we do uh, to uh, stop the deterioration of the importance of uh, OEC. So we knew there was a some, I think, need to think about certain, certain things. Let me also add that uh, from the point of view of the West, uh, I don't like this term particularly, but you mentioned it yourself. The point of view of, of the West, uh, in Indonesia is a very valuable, essential partner in the dialogue of uh, religions and civilization. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you are, you are the biggest Muslim country in the world, uh, and your system, which you described to us, uh, is one uh, of tolerance and of dialogue with others. And I think this is something that we desperately need uh, in times uh, like this. Uh, where one of the big problems of this world is the, uh, the uh, increasing uh, gap between, between religions, especially between the Muslim and the Christian religions. And I think uh, Indonesia has been playing and will continue to play very well with the essential role in this. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we, have, to, we have to come to an end. Uh, thanks to the uh, embassy uh, of Indonesia, we can offer you some refreshments. Now, I have to uh, mention also that I think the, the ambassador is still uh, is still held up uh, in, in one of those uh, end, probably endless meetings in, in, in England. Uh, some of the ambassadors sitting here know, know what I'm talking about. Uh, so thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for coming and uh, sharing with us uh, some of your, your very interesting ideas. And I wish you a very good day. Thank you.